Oleg Ivry. And he's going to talk about describing blush care products by their critical points. Oleg, please. Well, thank you, Javad, for your lovely introduction. Today, I'll talk about a problem which originates in complex analysis, but is really a question in nonlinear elliptic PDEs. So I'll begin by describing an analogy between polynomials and finite Blaschke products. One can define a polynomial as a proper homomorphic submapping of the complex plane. Proper means that the pre-image of a compact set is compact. It is easy to show that T decomposes as the product of linear factors. In the same spirit, one can define a finite Blaschke product as a proper holomorphic submapping of the unit disk. And one can show that it uh, decomposes as a product of automorphisms of the disk. Since polynomials and finite Blaschke products have many similar properties, one can, in some, some authors, call finite Blaschke products hyperbolic polynomials. So here is a picture from my PhD thesis, which is not related to this talk. It is a dynamical portrait of a Blaschke product. So here we have a Blaschke product of degree two, and it's normalized so that zero is an attracting fixed point. One, on the other hand, is a repelling fixed point. And in this region, The dynamics is in discrete jumps along monochromatic lines. So if you take a point Z and begin iterating, its orbit would look something like this. Now, the, since we are discussing a degree two Blaschke product, this region has to have two pre-images, itself and this region right here. Now this region has two pre-images, namely those two regions here. And from this point on, every region has two distinct pre-images and those style the unit disk. So when I think of Blaschke products, I think of pictures like this. Here is another degree to Blaschke product, and it's drawn in a somewhat different way. So, here, uh, zero is again an attacking fixed point, but here we connect it to a repelling periodic orbit of degree three, usually labeled one sevenths, two sevenths, and four sevenths in view of the conjugacy to z goes to z squared. So there are uh, some choices when you want to draw a Blaschke product. This picture shows how the Blaschke product changes when the parameter A degenerates. Here, we take A to one along the real axis. And in this picture, we take A to one holocyclically. Ho 
Okay, so back to the main uh, discussion. There is a famous theorem, which was stated by Gauss and proved by Lucas, which says that the critical points of a polynomial are contained in the convex hull of the zeros. Recall that a point is a critical point if it's the zero of the derivative. And in the same spirit, there is a remarkable theorem due to Walsh, which says that the critical points of a finite Blaschke product are contained in the hyperbolic convex hull of the zeros. And of course, in complex analysis, we equip the unit disk with a hyperbolic metric. And in which case, automorphisms of the disk act isometrically while holomorphic mappings are contractions. So this is a fancy way to state the Schwarz lemma. To set the stage, let us, uh, our starting point is a beautiful theorem due to Maurice Hines, which says that if you have a finite set of points in the unit disk, it arises as a critical set of an essentially unique Blaschke product. And here, unique means unique up to post compositions with Mobius transformations. So if you have um, a Blaschke product F and M is a Mobius transformation, then M composed with F and F have the same critical points. This can be easily seen from the chain rule. If you differentiate, you get this and M being a Mobius transformation, this factor never vanishes. So if you post compose with uh, Mobius transformations, you do not change the critical set. And this operation is also called Frostman shift. Actually, there is a version of this theorem for polynomials. If you want to construct a polynomial with prescribed critical set, C, you first construct the polynomial for which the set is the zero set and you integrate. However, Heinz theorem is much more complicated and requires nonlinear elliptic PDEs. Our objective is to extend Heinz theorem to infinite degree. And the most natural generalization of a finite Blaschke product to infinite degree is that of an inner function. So loosely speaking, an inner function is a homomorphic self-mapping of the disk, which extends to a measure theoretic dynamical system of the unit circle. More precisely, we require that for every theta, the radio limit exists and has absolute value one. However, if we try to generalize Heinz theorem to infinite degree, we run uh, into a very simple abstraction. Namely, different inner functions can have the same critical set. So here we have F1, the identity mapping. And F2 is the universal covering mapping of the function disk. And they have no critical points and yet are distinct functions. And the goal of this talk is to explain how to distinguish those two functions. So let me switch to my iPad if this is possible.
So can everyone see my iPad? Sure, I do. Yes, yes, uh, I also. So let's take a look at this mapping. So it takes the disk to itself. And it has a singularity at one and maps those curves to a slit. Of course, being the exponential of some function, it never vanishes. So zero is an omitted point. Now, each of those regions gets mapped conformally onto the complement of the slit. Now, being a covering map, it has no critical points. But what you can do is the following. By Heinz theorem, there should be a finite Blaschke product, which has a critical point, say at the point one minus one over n of multiplicity n. And in fact, it's quite easy to write down the exact expression in this case. So the picture is very, very similar except now you only have finding many curves instead of infinitely many. And as n goes to infinity, fn converge to f. So in some sense, it is very natural that the mapping f has some boundary critical structure. So I have switched back to my computer. Is this the case? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. So from our first talk, we know that an inner function can be decomposed into a Blaschke factor and a singular inner factor. In this decomposition, the Blaschke factor records the zero set of the inner function, while the singular inner part is zero free. It never vanishes because you have an exponential. And you should think of singular inner functions as degenerate Blaschke products, where the zeros have been exiled to the unit circle in a controlled way. And mu records the limiting distribution of the zeros. So it's supposed to be a singular measure. In this talk, you'll be concerned with uh, inner functions of finite entropy. So, inner functions which satisfy this condition. Now, inner functions are defined on the unit disk, and here we integrate over the unit circle. So, in the, this definition, we require that the radial limit of f prime should exist almost everywhere. So, maybe Arthur will discuss this, or he will discuss this in his mini course, but there's a beautiful theorem of Marcos Kreiser, which says that this is exactly the set of functions for which uh, F, uh, so for which a big measure has uh, finite entropy. Now, so this class of functions is very interesting because it admits uh, two kinds of characterizations, an analytic characterization and uh, one from dynamical systems. 
So now I should mention that there is a beautiful theorem of Aaron and Clark, which says that if you have an inner function of finite entropy, F prime can be decomposed into a Blaschke part, a singular part, and an outer part. I call this the Boston Symphony Orchestra decomposition. In general, if you have a nonlinear class function, you have to take the quotient of singular inner functions. So uh, the theorem of Aaron and Clark says something non-trivial. So what we do is we drop the orchestra. We just remove the outer part. So we define the critical structure of F as the B times the S. Here, B records the critical set and S records the critical structure. And because we are recording the critical structure, because we're recording more information, we can distinguish the two inner functions from the introduction. So Konstantin Vyakhinov asked the following question. To what extent is an inner function determined by its critical structure? And what uh, are the possible critical structures of inner functions? So Vyakhinov himself showed that the critical structure is trivial if and only if F is a Mobius transformation. Actually, several years ago, the Niela Krauss showed that the critical structure of a maximal Blaschke product of finite entropy is a Blaschke product. And conversely, any Blaschke product arises as the critical structure of a unique Blaschke product, maximal Blaschke product. And here, unique means unique up to Frostman shifts because uh, applying a Frostman shift does not change the critical structure. And my role was to understand uh, the role of singular factors. So I show the following theorem. Uh, I should mention that even though uh, the Niel approved your result six years before Professor Yakinov, she stated her result in a slightly different language. So it's not that Professor Yakinov was stupid and didn't read the literature. So I showed that an inner function is uniquely determined by its critical structure up to Frostman shifts. And at the time, I was thinking that any inner function can arise as the critical structure. But this turned out not to be true. So for an inner function to be the critical structure of some f, it the, the Blaschke factor can be anything as in Krauss' theorem, but the singular measure has to be sufficiently concentrated. More precisely, it should live on a countable union of Berlin Krauss and Satz. So this theorem gives a parameterization of the space of inner functions of finite entropy. To specify an inner function of finite entropy, you need to give me a Blaschke sequence and a singular measure that satisfies this condition. So a building Carlson set is a closed subset of the unit circle, which has measure zero. And if you take a look at the complementary intervals, the sum over the complementary arcs should be finite. So such sets appeared in the work of Collison uh, as boundary zero sets of smooth analytic functions. So analytic functions which extend smoothly to the unit circle. However, measures which don't charge building Collison sets in other words, measures which give zero mass to any building cards and set appeared only in the 1970s, independently in the works of uh, Boris Kovenblum and James Roberts in the context of 
cyclic functions in Bergman spaces. More on this later. So before I continue, let us do the following experiment. Well, I have already discussed this one. So suppose that Fn is a finite Blaschke product, which has a critical point at one minus one over N of multiplicity N, normalized in the usual way. In this case, one can show that the Fn's converge to the function f delta one, which has critical structure as delta one. So in this particular example, the critical structure survives in the limit, meaning that in f prime is the limit as n goes to infinity of in f n prime. However, in general, some part of the critical structure can be lost. So let's take a look at a slightly modified example. Here, Fn is again a Blaschke product of degree n plus one. And now we put the critical points along the circle of radius one minus one over n, and we space them apart by theta n, where theta n is some number. Now, if this quantity here tends to zero, then the critical structure survives. And however, if this quantity here tends to infinity, then the critical structure dies. So the Fn's converge to the identity. And the identity has no critical points and no critical structure. Of course, in Fn prime, still converges to uh, S delta one. And by, and, and one can interpolate between those two examples to get anything in between. So we can find examples where the critical structure survives partially. And this leads to a very natural topology on the space of inner functions of finite entropy. So we say that Fn converges to F if the following uh, two properties hold. First, if Fn converges uniformly to F on compact subsets of the disk. And second, we require that the Navalina splitting is stable in the limit. So the Navalina splitting is the splitting of F and prime into inner and outer parts. And I gave a concrete description of this topology. So now let's turn to the methods of the proof. Recall that the Gaussian curvature of a conformal metric is given by this rather unimpressive formula. The following two examples will be useful. The hyperbolic metric has curvature minus one, while the Euclidean metric is flat, has curvature zero. In similar spirit, the spherical metric has constant curvature plus one. The importance of Gaussian curvature to complex analysis comes from Gauss theorema aggregium, which says that curvature is a conformal invariant. So that if F is a homomorphic submapping of the disk, then what you can do is you can take, you can pull back lambda T by F, to obtain a metric lambda f. And it's supposed to be a conformal metric of curvature minus one on the complement of the set of critical points. Now, on the critical set, f prime vanishes so that lambda f is only a pseudo metric. 
to better recall this information, it's useful to pass to the log of lambda f, which I call uf. And uf satisfies the, the following uh, partial differential equation, which I call the Gauss curvature equation. So Louisville proved the following fantastic theorem. Any solution of the Gauss curvature equation with integral singularities arises from this construction. And moreover, uh, UF determines F uniquely up to a Fossman shift. So here, uh, integral singularities means that this mass is discrete. And every delta mass is a multiple of two pi. So Heinz himself, working in the 1960s, was afraid of singularities. The way he worked was he cut out uh, those singularities out of the domain and then analyzed the behavior of solutions in the neighborhood of those singularities. And the works of Daniela Krauss and Oliver Roth continue in this tradition. However, since then, mathematicians learned how to deal with PDEs that involve singularities. So uh, singularities have become, so PDEs with measure value singularities have become pretty much commonplace thanks to the works of Heim Brezis, uh, Moshe Marcus, and Laurent Piron. Okay. So let's take a look at the Gauss curvature equation. It has a unique maximal solution, which I call U max. And it's just log of the hyperbolic metric. The maximality of the solution, so it's pointwise maximal, it dominates every other solution pointwise. And the maximality is just alpha of the statement of the Schwarz lemma. Now you may find the strange that the solution blows up to infinity as Z approaches the unit circle. So let's do an experiment. Let's first take a look at this PDE and pose the boundary value problem by asking for constant boundary value n. In this case, the solution is the harmonic function with boundary values n, it's just n. And as n tends to infinity, you n blow up. However, if we look at the Gauss curvature equation, it says that the function u is very subharmonic. Subharmonic means that a passing of u is positive. And the exponential here is very, very big. So it's uh, super subharmonic. So the value of a point is actually much less than the average value of the boundary. So in this case, the functions un with constant boundary value n did not blow up. They actually converge to something nice. And this is related to the fact that solutions to ODEs can blow up in finite time. So if you want, you can convert this PDE to an ODE by looking at radially invariant solutions. Now, Louisville's theorem is a truly fantastic result because it provides a bridge between complex analysis and uh, PDEs. So it uh, allows one to translate questions in complex analysis to questions in PTEs and vice versa. However, it is difficult to find questions that are simultaneously interesting in both settings. And it turns out that Yakinov's question is one of those rare questions. It turns out that Yakinov's question is equivalent to finding solutions that are close to maximal or nearly maximal in this sense. 
So we are looking for solutions of the Gauss curvature equation, which satisfy this uh, property. And we want to classify those solutions. So what we do is the following. For any radius between zero and one, we examine this measure on the circle of radius r. And because u max is the maximal solution, u max is at least u, so this is a positive measure. And it's easy to see that this function, u max minus u, is subharmonic. Namely, one needs to check that its Laplacian is positive. But its Laplacian is just this. And u max is bigger than u, so this is uh, positive. So since this is a subharmonic function, one can extract. So the weak limit as r goes to one exists, and we denote it uh, by the measure mu of u. And it turns out that this measure mu which I call the boundary deficiency measure, uniquely determines the solution U. This is an exercise uh, of, it follows from Cato's inequality. So the question is which measures occur as boundary deficiency measures? Which measures come from this construction? And here we have the following theorem. It says that, that any measure on the circle can be decomposed into a constructible part and an invisible part. The invisible part is purely not in the image. So no part of the invisible measure can be seen from this construction. And the constructible part is the biggest part of the measure which lies in the image of this map. And there is a very nice description of the constructible part. So what we do is the following. We take the measure mu and look at its Poisson extension to the unit disk and form the function u max minus p mu. Now this is a sub-solution. So if you take the Laplacian of uh, u max minus p mu, you get e to the two u max because the Poisson extension is harmonic. And this is bigger than two to the u max minus p mu. So this inequality means that u max minus p mu is a subsolution. Now it's well known that if you have a subharmonic function on the disk, it has a minimal harmonic major. And similarly, if you have a subsolution, it has a minimal dominating solution. There is only one difference. The minimal harmonic major of a subharmonic function could be plus infinity. But in this case, the minimal dominating solution is a genuine function. So this theorem uh, is proved using the methods developed in the papers of Daniela Krauss and Oliver Roth. So I studied all the papers and I picked, I cherry picked facts from each of them and compiled them into this theorem. And it turns out that this is a very genuine result. It holds for other PDEs, any smoothly bounded domain and is valid in higher dimensions. The only issue is that for other PDEs, it's probably vacuous. This class of nearly maximal solutions is most likely empty. Okay, so the difficulty becomes how does one connect constructible measures 
to building cars and cells. So in one direction, we have the theorem of Michael Cullen from 1971, which says that if you have a measure which lives on a building cars and set, then S mu prime lies in N. And this follows from the Frostman lemma that was mentioned in Arthur's talk. It's a very simple computation. However, in our language, Cullen's theorem says that this function u is nearly maximal. And from this, uh, it's easy to conclude that mu is a contractible measure. Now, from my theorem, it follows that Cullen's theorem is essentially sharp. This condition here implies that mu lives on a countable union of building cars and sets. And the master of all possible martingales, Arthur Nicolau, gave a very elementary proof of this fact. So you must wonder who Arthur is to deserve such an auspicious title. So this is the easy direction. And now I'll say a few words about the difficult direction. What is not too difficult is to show the following. If you have a measure mu, which uh, satisfies this modulus of continuity condition, then it is invisible. It's not in the image. And the proof uh, goes like this. So let's go back a few slides. So if the measure mu is small, then p mu is small, which means that u max minus p mu is very close to u max. From there, you can show that the minimal dominating solution is nothing more but u max itself. So this is how the argument goes in this case simply because uh, this is very close to u max. Now, here we come to a fantastic theorem of Roberts. But before this, let me say a few words. So this difficulty between the T log one of a T condition and measures not charging building cars and sets has, this difficulty was known in the 1960s and resolved by Korenblum uh, and Roberts in the 1970s, as I mentioned. And I began reading the papers of Boris Korenblum because he's a famous mathematician. And I spent months studying the technical de details. And at the time, I learned very little. And at one fateful day in August, August 8th, I remember this day, I looked at Robert's paper and I immediately uh, found it to be genius. And what Robert did is he gave a very concrete uh, description of measures that don't charge building cars and sets. Essentially, he showed the following, that if you have a measure which does not charge point cars and sets, it can be decomposed as a countable sum of measures satisfying the T log one of a T condition at a super exponential set of scales. So he used this beautiful theorem, beautiful and unexpected theorem, to resolve a question about cyclic inner functions in Bergman spaces. And what I did was I took his argument and uh, transported it to my setting and it worked beautifully. So what I did was essentially similar to what a musician does when he takes a piece written for the piano and transcribes it to the violin. However, I should say that Robert's argument 
is even more natural in the, in the setting of Yakinov's problem. So uh, let me say a few words about how it goes. So let me switch to my iPad. So can, can you see my iPad? We do. So the goal is to show that the meme of dominating solution of u max minus p mu is just u max itself. And mu is some kind of infinite sum. Now it's enough to find uniform estimates on the mean of dominating solution of u max minus this finite sum here. And one can show that this can be written in this form. Um, so I wrote the measures in the wrong direction. I apologize. And here I usually give the story about fighting Diablo. So Diablo is uh, an old RPG game where you're supposed to kill various monsters and level up. And Diablo is like the, 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 the demon who's like the final boss of this game. He has many health points. So the way this works is first you hit Diablo, and then he hits you. And then you hit Diablo again, and he hits you back, and so forth. But since Diablo has many, many health points, you die. However, most likely, you're not alone. In your party, you could have a healer. And if this healer is healing you faster than Diablo is dealing you damage, you're essentially invis invisible. So you see those minus signs. This is Diablo punching you in the face. This is your healer. So once you do this set of operations, you end up with uh, essentially U max. And this is the proof. Okay, so let me go back to my slides. So for comparison, let me mention a problem which has been studied in PDEs. So here we work in the union ball in n dimensions, and we study a slightly different uh, PTE. And we say that a solution U is L1 bounded if it satisfies this very natural condition. In the same spirit, one can extract the weak limit of such measures as R goes to one and obtain a measure on the unit sphere. And then one can show that one obtains an embedding of L1 bounded solutions into the space of measures on the sphere. And then the question becomes which measures occur. And this question was answered in the 90s by a number of eminent mathematicians. The answer depends on Q, this exponent here. So if Q is small, then Gmira and Viron show that every measure occurs. 
But if Q is large, then not every measure occurs. For measure to occur, it has to be sufficiently diffuse. And diffuse uh, with technically means diffuse with respect to this sobolev capacity. So the Q equals to two case was done by Yago using the Brownian snake or branching Brownian motion. And later, Dinkin and Kuznetsov extended Legault's result to this range over here using similar techniques. So this is the same Dinkin from Dinkin diagrams. He's one of the few mathematicians who has made contributions to two entirely different fields. And several years later, Marcus and Viron used probabilistic, uh, uh, sorry, PDE techniques quite similar to what I used uh, to handle the general case. Note that in Yakinov's question, a measure is good if it's sufficiently concentrated. It must live on accountable unit building cards and sets. But in this problem, a measure is good if, it, if it's sufficiently spread out. So one can view my result as an analog of nonlinear potential theory, which studies uh, such capacities. OK, so to conclude, let me mention some work in progress. So let's so say that F is an inner function of finite entropy. And in a fine equals to B times S mu. And the question is, how does F look like? So the first conjecture is perhaps the easiest to understand. Uh, one uh, asks that for almost every zeta with respect to mu, this limit as R goes to one exists and is strictly inside the GS. Notice that mu is a singular measure, so we are asking about the behavior of F of this inner function on a measure zero set of rays. And in fact, having such limits in the disk is uh, not too exotic. So for instance, if you have a singular inner function, then for every zeta, in the support for almost every zeta in the support of mu, the radial limit equals to zero. Now, as discussed in the previous talks by Arturo and Oliver, when you have an inner function, you can take its Frostman shifts. So, Here, MW is just the Mobius transformation, which takes uh, Z to W to zero. And for most, uh, sorry, there should be an F. For most points W, the Frostman shift is a Blaschke product, so it contains no singular factors. And the exceptional set is when there is a non-trivial singular inner factor. And if W is an exceptional point, then this measure is non-trivial. And therefore, the function f has directions in which the radial limit equals to w. So having a rich exceptional, exceptional set means that you have plenty of directions where this limit is strictly inside the disk. However, it turns out that there is a gap between, say, maximal Blaschke products and indestructible ones. So this kinds of arguments using the exceptional set 
cannot give you the whole story. And the whole story is probably conjecture one. Um, conjecture two is a conjecture from science fiction. When I was a postdoc at Caltech, I thought about this conjecture and decided it was really stupid. The idea is to understand critical values of inner functions. Now, when I think of critical values, I do the following. So I take F and F may have no critical points. So may not have critical values. But the way you should understand critical values is by looking at a stable approximation of F by finite Blaschke products. So a, a good approximation. There are some stupid ones. So if you don't know anything stupid, now what you do is for, for each approximating Blaschke product Fn, you construct this measure, which lives on inside the unit disk. It's called the critical value measure. And the hope is that this limit exists, does not depend on the choice of the approximating sequence Fn, and is strictly supported in the disk. So usually when you take a weak star limit of measures supported on the disk, you may get a measure which lives on the closed unit disk. But here I uh, say that it leaves on the open unit disk. And the reason I say this theorem looks like it's a theorem from science fiction is because we are essentially discussing convergence, uniform convergence of compact sets. So if the critical points escape to the, the unit circle, it's not, it, it seems very strange that you should have control over their values because uniform convergence compact sets means you have control of, of what happens in compact subsets, not what happens when a point escape to the circle. Nevertheless, I believe that conjectures one and two are true uh, because I proved them in special cases. And hopefully with my graduate students, we would handle the general case hopefully soon. Okay, so let me give you one small fact which is relevant. So let me convince you that inner functions do have critical values in this extended sense. Now, to explain this, let's take a, let's recall the following famous theorem. Take the, the set of finite Blaschke products and close it up, take its closure in the uniform topology and compact subset of, of the GS. And then you get the unit ball in H infinity. So this is a well-known result. Uh, Javad probably knows it and probably so does half the audience. However, now take a look at a sequence of functions for which the entropy uh, is bounded above by some constant. So inner functions for which this integral is bounded by C. And this set is compact. If you take any subsequential limit of the F ends, you have to get an inner function. So you cannot get a function like uh, Z over two when you have such a uh, bound on the entities. Uh, so, I'll st stop here. Thank you very much, Oleg. Let's thank the speaker first. Any question or comments for, for Oleg? Uh, Oleg, about these inner functions with finite entropy, 
Is there any work on the relation between the two measures, the one which represent the function and the one which represent the, the derivative? So, 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 so if you have a function f and it yeah, has yeah. a decomposition, yeah. And you have a derivative? Yes. I mean, in the last at least two talks, yeah, we heard about the relation between the Z, uh, the Z, B prime is not, yeah, another B. Yeah, we, we heard well, about uh, the relation. So it's easy to see that sigma contains mu. And mm -hmm. this is a simple exercise by differentiation. Mm -hmm. However, sigma actually contains singular measures of all the Flossman shifts. So in fact, one has this inequality as well. This is due to Aaron and Clark. In particular, this shows that the exceptional set of an inner function of finite entropy is at most countable. However, mm -hmm. again, this could be a strict inequality. And this mm -hmm. is one of the reasons why PD methods are probably stronger than simply just tinkering with exceptional sets. Mu W is for all Frostman shifts, yeah? Yes. Okay. So all those measures are mutually singular. Yes. Oh, and then they all sit Ben is sigma. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. All right, let, let me ask you one thing. Uh, in in your last slide where you were presenting these two conjectures. So is it the case that, uh, um, does it make any sense to ask uh, first what happens in the case of, uh, for instance, uh, covering maps of say the disk minus say two points, for instance? Yes. So in the case when U is uh, discrete made up of atoms, the conjectures one and two are known. Yeah, but I was asking when the, when the function f is precisely uh, the, the, the covering map of the disk minus two points, where in, I guess in that case, the measure will, would in that case, the, the, the measure be discrete? Yes. Even if the set of singularities is very large, right? Yes. Okay. Okay, and in that case, you would uh, you, uh, you know that the answer is yes. Say, y yes. We pulled this like two weeks ago. Oh, I see. <laughs> I see. I see. Mm -hmm. uh, can I ask a question? Please go ahead. Uh, hi, Oleg. Uh, so, uh, very nice talk. Uh, I have a particular question uh, regarding this uh, uh, thing about being es this essentially sharp result from McCollum, so the, the converse of that. Uh, uh, you, you mentioned that, uh, that uh, well, so it follows from your result, but then you mentioned that Artur has an elementary proof of this. Hi, Artur. Uh, maybe, maybe hi, some... Hi, 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 uh, how are you? So maybe some of you could, could some of you fill in a little bit about this because I've been thinking about this uh, for some time. Uh, uh, how this should go, how one should, can go on about in this book. Yeah, it's, it's this one precisely. So you had some elementary proof of this. I mean, could you just briefly explain a little bit how, how that is done or? It has been a while. Okay. I apologize. Most of this work has been done like several years ago. Okay. 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 Is it some simple trick uh, with uh, this uh, Ahern representation or, or what, what was it? It's, it's a Martin deal argument. Ah, okay. I see. I see. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. Okay. All right. Maybe I can ask Artur about this uh, later. Yeah. 
Any further comments or questions for Oleg? If not, let's thank him again. Wonderful.